Okay, there is a quorum in the room, so we're going to resume. Counselors, could you please take your seats so we can get started? Okay, so we're going to uh, call our first delegation. Um, Jay Garlow, co-founder of Hidden Harvest Ottawa, and Laura Bennett. Are they here? Okay, well, we'll stand that one down again and uh, call them um, a little later. So Don Lyons, Director of Community Service of Pinecrest Queensway Community Health Centre, and Don will be followed by Ray Sullivan, Executive Director of Centre Town Citizens Ottawa Corporation. Good afternoon. You just to press the button to turn on your microphone. You have five minutes. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Dawn Lyons, and I'm the Community Services Director with Pinecrest Queensway Community Health Centre. I'd like to begin by thanking Council for including a 3% cost of living increase and an addition of $325,000 in the draft budget. We also appreciate last year's investment of $500,000 to help agencies address growing needs and operating pressures. These are definite steps in the right direction when it comes to investing in the social infrastructure of our city. That said, it's important to note that the needs of our community far exceed the resources currently being allocated, and that two years of investment do not make up for the loss of approximately $3 million during the period 2011 to 2016 when the sustainability fund was put on hold. I'm here today to highlight the importance of ongoing investments in social infrastructure to meet the needs of our city's vulnerable communities. One community in Pinecrest Queensway's catchment area where this is well illustrated is Bayshore. I'd like to start us off by introducing Cheryl Andrew, a resident from the Bayshore community, who's agreed to share her thoughts on how investing in social infrastructure makes a difference at the neighborhood level. Hi, my name is Cheryl Andrew. I have lived in Bayshore for 30 years, where I am a single parent to four amazing children. I am the president of Bayshore Park Community Oven and Garden, active member of Community Development Framework in Bayshore, volunteer at Mobile Market, Market Mobile, and a graduate of Safe People Training. As you can see, I live a very rich life, which has been made possible by these programs that are supported by Pinecrest Queensway Community Health Workers. Programs. I would not have known about had it not been for the health worker in our community who told me about them. I'm only one of many people who have been so enriched by community health worker from Pinecrest Queensway Community Health Centre. With this support, my diverse neighbourhood is more connected, has more ac access to food supports and has a better community space. Thank you. As you may know, Bayshore is a culturally diverse rental neighborhood with approximately 8,000 residents. Compared to the city as a whole, Bayshore residents face many risk factors, including a significantly higher percentage of children and youth living on low income, a higher percentage of low-income families, or low par lone parent families, a higher percentage of people spending 30% of their income on, on shelter, and a higher percentage of unemployed people. Yet despite the scope of the need, PQ receives very limited core resources to support our work in this neighbourhood. As a result, we've been operating on short-term project dunning, uh, funding for more than a decade. Over the years, we've been successful in leveraging project funding from diverse sources, including the Community Development Framework, which has allowed us to engage residents in identifying and addressing their neighbourhood's needs using a community development approach. This work has resulted in many positive initiatives which were supported by our local city councillor, Mark Taylor. These initiatives include establishing a community garden and collective kitchen to address food security, successfully advocating for a local grocery store to increase access to affordable food, 
and establishing an outdoor bake oven to bring residents together to build community cohesion. Yet despite these and other important advances, we've been unable to secure sustainable funding to keep this essential community development work alive. At this point, we're unable to identify any other sources of funding to support this work and are deeply concerned that without adequate staffing, we're at risk of losing the momentum that has been created through our efforts to date. Staffing is also required to strengthen our capacity to outreach to and offer programming for those who are most vulnerable, including children, youth, newcomers, isolated seniors, and families. Last year, we were successful in securing an additional $9,000 through the Sustainability Fund, bringing our annual renewable city funding up to just over $36,000. Unfortunately, this does not even fund one full-time position. To effectively serve this community of 8,000 residents, we require at least one full-time staff and one part-time staff, along with some basic operating dollars to pay for program supplies a total investment of approximately $109,000. Unfortunately, we know that our situation is not unique and that there are many other organizations that face significant gaps in responding to community needs. For this reason, as a member of Making Voices Count, we join with 80 social service agencies across the city to ask for a long-term sustainable investment in social infrastructure that responds to the growing needs and disparities in Ottawa. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? Councillor Taylor. Thanks very much, um, Madam Chair, and thank you very much for coming out today and sharing your deputation. I know we had an opportunity to meet not too long ago. Um, and Cheryl, thank you for adding. I always think it's wonderful when residents come and help add color to you know, a presentation that an organization is making. I know Charles and Mete are here as well from, uh, from Bayshore, so thank you for coming out. Um, Don, you know, we've talked a lot about, about Bayshore, about how it's a, you know, it was one of the original CDF neighborhoods, which councillors around this table who served, you know, back some time ago will remember the CDF framework. Um, we, you know, we've got a brand new or renewed field house that's opening in a couple of days, which creates more space capacity in the neighborhood, which was lacking. You've talked specifically about the funding aspects. I know right now you're essentially kind of shaving administrative nickels from different kind of funding streams to pull it together. Can you talk maybe a little bit about, you know, from an organizational perspective, how much time and energy are you investing in doing that versus, you know, would, would you, I guess, would you suggest that, and I'm not leading you, but would you suggest that it, it's more, it would be more efficient for us to simply fund a stream rather than make you spend administrative dollars hunting for money? Absolutely. That it, it's a really, it is a really significant time eater, and we do spend a, a, a significant amount of time each year trying to apply for small pockets of funding. This year, we have a little pocket of funding from United Way to do some children and youth activities. We're applying to community development framework, and we really appreciate all those pockets of uh, funding. But it takes uh, staff time to apply for the funding. It takes these are t tend to be project-based uh, um, initiatives takes project uh, time, staff time to be monitoring those uh, very specific activities and then of course the re reporting on that so it's really not an efficient approach um, and that is part of our concern for sure so uh, you know from a I know from a kind of overall PQ perspective you've got several people whose real sole job it is to just hunt for funding report on funding and write funding uh, you know applications more or less um, c can you quantify that I mean you tell us uh, more uh, I'm not asking for an exact number but could you quantify that and say you know we have the equivalent of three FTEs or two FTEs whose sole job it is is to hunt funding um, I it would be hard to quantify that to be honest we don't um, it's very we do a lot of the you know looking for funding and applying for funding but it is very much off the side of our desk it's not actually a part of anybody's um, you know a core part of anybody's job descriptions so we're all doing it off the side of our desk um, yeah I, I'm not sure off the top of my head I could quantify okay, that but fine. it is certainly a significant amount so of even time. finding the funding is is not funded no. yeah okay Thank you very much for your presentation today and, uh, and thank you to members of the committee for hearing it. Thanks so much.
Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Taylor, and thank you for being here. Our next speaker is Ray Sullivan, the Executive Director of Centertown Citizens Ottawa Corporation. And then, uh, is Jay Garlow and Laura Bennett here now? Is Laura here? Yeah. Okay, so you'll be up after Mr. Sullivan. Good thank you, Councillor Dean, and, and good afternoon to the committee. Uh, my name is Ray Sullivan. I work for CCOC. We're a community-led, private, nonprofit landlord. And we rent out almost 1,600 affordable homes and about 50 properties across Ottawa. And you know, actually, the five councillors across me are perfectly arranged in, in, in Rideau Vanier, Rideau Rockcliffe, and Somerset Ward, Kitchissippi River Ward, and Bay Ward. Um, it's been an exciting couple of months in the affordable housing world. Just a few weeks ago, the federal government released its national housing strategy that showed increased and sustained uh, funding and commitments for affordable housing. A little bit before that, and that, that was an initiative led by, by parliamentarians Adam Vaughan and, and Johnny Zuclo, the minister. A few weeks before that, I was in a room on Parliament Hill with them where they were expressing their, their frustration, that they were already seeing signs that as the federal government was moving greater investment in the front door, that some provinces and municipalities were sneaking money out the back door at the same time. And it was very much their intention that as the federal government steps forward and steps up, that provinces and municipalities do the same and work together uh, to increase their commitment and make progress on this very important file. Just last week, CMHC released its rental market report for the City of Ottawa. For about four years, we've enjoyed a balanced rental market in the city with vacancy rates of around 3%. As of this last report, we are back down to our abysmally low vacancy rate level of under 2%, 1.7%, in fact. The 2016 census data also came out not too long ago, and it confirmed that in the city of Ottawa, 40% of all renters are in core housing need. Two out of every five renters cannot afford the rents where they're staying right now. And the answer is supply. We need to build more nonprofit and co op housing, and we need to protect the supply of rental housing that we have now, especially that which is already affordable to our lowest income neighbors. The City of Ottawa can do more. It currently relies a lot on federal and provincial funding to do anything beyond going, the exist going beyond the existing status quo. Up until several years ago, the city put, used to put $4 million of its own discretionary funding toward increasing the supply of affordable rental housing. That was cut several years ago. The city could restore that. The city could also prioritize affordable housing development along transit corridors where they're being rezoned and those communities replanned. The city could be integrating housing and social equity lenses into its major policy planning initiatives. There are some voices at City Hall who hold to the idea that we have to freeze property taxes at a 2% annual increase. And they present that the logic is this is to keep the city more affordable. But I ask, affordable for whom? And I worry that we are keeping the city more affordable for homeowners while we are making it less and less affordable for our lowest income and economically vulnerable neighbors. So I asked the city to consider housing affordability when it looks at its budget. And as a homeowner myself, I'm asking you to raise my property taxes greater than 2%. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sullivan. Uh, are there any questions for the delegation? Uh, we will move now to Jay Garlow, co-founder of Hidden Harvest Ottawa, and Laura Bonnet. And they will be followed by Zora Kalamadin from Centertown Grassroots Group.
apologize for the delay. We're a bit squirrely. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so we're at Hidden Harvest Ottawa. Um, this is my Jason and, and Laura. Um, we are uh, here to, to, to pick and share. Thanks so much. Sorry about that. Uh, we we want to create a food tree friendly city where, where everyone uh, has uh, is empowered to access, share, and make full use of their local fruit and nuts. Um, this is our ask. Um, this is our ask in black and white for you to see. Provide an on ramp uh, for established organizations to access renewable community funding, uh, including or, uh, organizations with mixed environmental or mixed social environmental benefits. Um, to our city and citizens. Um, we're looking at the community funding line, specifically the growth amount, the, the $325,000 um, there for growth. Um, and we, we'd like you to consider moving to direct that funding to on-ramp a few organizations in 2018 while you research and figure out what you want to do in 2019. Because we know that planting a few seeds early can make a huge difference just a few years down the line. If you saw us on the street, this is what you'd see. It'd be a very diverse group of neighbors maybe m meeting for the first time under a tree in their neighborhood that they may not have even identified as a fruit or nut tree before. They're going to learn how to harvest it, pick, sort, share um, that fresh food and nuts. So we can't clap, but the, uh, the chair has kindly said that we can make an apple picking notion if you've heard of Hidden Harvest. So just so I know how many people have heard of us before, thank you for your apple picking. The police back there, we don't get in trouble much. So no media, okay. Um, so if you, if you know us, you know that um, we, we share the food uh, four different ways, and we're not just picking apples, right? It's service berries, elderberries, pears, grapes, apricots, black walnuts, hazelnuts. Right now we're picking ginkgo nuts off the ground. They're a bit stinky, but it's great. We share that food four ways. So um, one quarter, at least a quarter, goes to the nearest food bank or agency. Quarter goes to the volunteers. Quarter goes to the homeowners. Um, often our homeowners don't have the ability or mobility to, to pick the food, but they still can make delicious pies, jams, and jellies. Right, so we leave a quarter share with them. Other cases, they're just too busy. That small pitcher is the 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 ambassador to Norway here in Canada. Toby, he, she's in your ward. You have some nice big yards in your ward, um, and she let us harvest her elderberry trees. We took those trees down to. D uh, Councillor Dean, you're near your ward, a uh, place a lot of our volunteers from your ward pass by on their way to work. Bicycle Craft Brewery. This Saturday, they're launching an amazing elderberry saison that's great to pair with turkey and dressing. So, um, and that's the elderberries taken from us. And then, so that's the local business, the, 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 the economics part of uh, our program. And yeah, we start them young. Sometimes we're criticized for that. Um, but it makes great work. I'm old, I don't want to be bending over to pick up all these nuts off the ground, right? Um, so they're well skilled. And so when we talk about the volunteers, we have two lines there. So the blue line is the number of individuals who have registered on our website saying that they want to pick fruit. Often uh, they want to bring a friend or a child um, or a relative with them, we appreciate that. And so that number really in reality is probably twice that big or twice that many people. Um, but then the orange line underneath are the amount of people we currently have the capacity to engage and allow to help us harvest fruit. So these are the, the families and the children that they bring along and the seniors that come out to help pick, sort, and share food. Um, and we're also, as well as social, we're trying to address an environmental need, right? of the residents. So George, this is your ward. Oh, I didn't change that slide. This is your ward, George. You have even bigger yards than Toby. Uh, this is one homeowner in your yard. Uh, his backyard had like 10 trees. We get 1,600 pounds of fruit from our volunteers in a couple of hours. It was incredible and they're great quality too. They're caring, passionate people. Um, and 
we realized, you know, there's a reason they call it Apple Blossom Road, right? Like, they're, they're, you're not joking. Um, so it, it prepared us. Uh, we weren't prepared. It surprised us. So here's a graph. It, I'll zoom in a bit. At the very, Mr. very top, Garlo, this is you have about 30 seconds 30 left. seconds, yep. The trees were able to harvest 19,200, but you scroll all the way down, and that's us at the very, very, very grassroots. This is our last slide. Um, the orange line are the trees that homeowners have asked us to harvest. The gray line are the trees that we're able to harvest, and that is only because half of our time is harvesting. The other half is fundraising to get just around $20,000 to do the ongoing core costs. Um, and we're doing a lot with the city's urban forest management plan. We're amazed that this coming year, that, or sorry, next year and the next two years, they're doing a, uh, they're including us in their uh, big outreach uh, engagement strategy. It's a big marketing campaign which will highlight the alternative urban values, such as uh, harvesting food. And um, that's great, but that's only going to make the demand lines grow, right? That's not going to okay, raise Mr. our capacity. Garlo, I'm going to have yeah. to hold you there. So thank, thank you, you but much. don't go away because there's some questions for you, starting with Councillor Eglai. Uh, Madam Chair, um, I, I recall a, a presentation made a number of years ago at, at committee mm -hmm. um, in, in a similar way. Um, and uh, you do some very interesting work. And I remember us having a discussion in the committee at that time that um, there was some technical reason, the, the nature of how you characterized your endeavor, which uh, didn't allow the city to provide funding. I think it's because you were, you were a social enterprise as opposed to a not-for-profit mm -hmm. or a charity. I think that was the distinction. Um, you're nodding your head, so I think you remember the, the discussion that was had at the time. Um, so it, it wasn't necessarily at that point in time a, a, a disinterest in helping out. It was a legislative or legal issue that didn't allow us to help out. So I'm wondering if there's been any change in your model or your designation since you were last a committee. Sorry. Um, well, uh, we're actually in discussions right now with Tides Canada, uh, which, is, which is a social platform hosting how many NGOs is it? 40 so. About 40 or so uh, NGOs. Uh, and it's a nonprofit and a charity organization. Uh, and organizations like Not Far From The Tree in Toronto are, have become a part of this uh, Tides Canada. And we're in discussions with them right now to uh, become uh, incorpor incorporated as a nonprofit and a charity under them. But our dilemma is that we don't actually uh, have enough money <laughs> for them to recognize us because we haven't been elig eligible for grants, m most of the grants, uh, because we're n we haven't been a nonprofit. So we're a bit in a chicken and an egg right now, but we are, our goal within the next month or so is to become nonprofit and charity. Yeah. So, so what is your current designation now? Uh, currently, we are a social purpose business. Um, we, because of uh, the core funding through the Ontario Self-Employment Benefit, they allowed us to create a social enterprise, but under a provincial business, um, so that we would pay taxes on any profit we made. I guess, luckily, we haven't made any profit, and uh, so now it's time to call an apple an apple, and it'd be look, like, look, we're non-profit. So much of our work is charitable. We're giving away 75% of our harvest, only making a bit of revenue off of a quarter. Um, so we're uh, moving from a Ontario provincial business um, to a uh, uh, char charity organization. Okay, so you're, you are going to make that move, okay, because yeah. mm -hmm. that, I think, was part of the difficulty last time, as I say, not disinterest necessarily, but an inability to help out. So, so thank you for that. Right. Thank you, Councillor Aguilar, Councillor Fleury. So I think that's that's good because I certainly had heard from colleagues you know, concerns or were over the structure of the organization. I, I wasn't worried because I think the, uh, the the graph that you showed with the four quadrants uh, demonstrate the the holistic approach uh, to uh, to the model and to your organization. I love the work you do. Uh, thank you for coming out to uh, the budget speak session. You uh, you certainly uh, drew a lot of attention and, and demonstrated the importance of the program. Can you just be a little tiny bit clearer? The 20, so you're talking about the efforts of the volunteers to fundraise, but if we take that aside for a second, and the $20,000 gives what, or it allows Hidden Harvest to do what it for, for the city of Ottawa, or for residents of the city of Ottawa? Um, so uh, we, the 
uh, to harvest city-owned trees, we need a lot of liability insurance. We have to administrate consent to enter permit. This is currently against bylaws to pick fruit and nuts from public parks. Uh, even that photo of the kids picking in the land down uh, orchard, uh, the apple orchard at Lansdowne, um, that is a, that's against bylaws unless you have a proper consent to enter permit which puts all of the legal liability onto us. Um, so it, it's that type of thing. It supports a uh, um, one part-time staff to help deal with all the paperwork because we have to do report backs to the city on all of that as well. Um, and w then we also have to do all of the coordination uh, around that. So liability insurance, then also the technology platform that we're using to keep our administration expense low, that the it's the core administration. I would say to keep the lights on or to keep the phones open, but we don't even have phones or doors. Um, we're working out of Impact Hub Ottawa uh, part of the time for what we can afford, and other um, lawyer offices and places are volunteering desks that our people can work at, yeah. Which rich proportion? So it's great you're very clear uh, on the, the twenty thousand. The legal liability portion is how much of the twenty thousand? Uh, I I could get back to you on that. I'd look in. Please, yeah. Okay. Sure. Thank you. And Laura, did you want to add something to that? No. Uh, just in terms of what you're saying, you asked what we're to the city. Oh, what we're contributing to the city? Oh. Okay. I was just curious specifically for the 20,000, uh, what, what that would mean for you. And, and I was right. clear, thank you. Right, and r really what it does mean is, is that we, uh, the, 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 corporation, the corporate um, partnerships and the fundraising that we're currently doing, that's just barely sustaining it. What the 20,000 would mean uh, is that all of that money could then go towards growth, right? And then we could be growing. It wouldn't be, if we knew we could keep the lights on, like, like Laura had mentioned, organizations like Tiger, like, oh, the city has bought in, they're willing to put a little bit of money towards supporting this great uh, social entrepreneurship. Uh, if they're on board for the next four or five years, we'll de definitely get on board because then the, the fundraising we already do, that brings us up to the level where they take us seriously and, and bring us on board and, uh, and we can uh, uh, really make good use of our charitable purpose, right? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, there's one more question, Councillor Gekic. Thank you, uh, Chair, and I also recall a couple of years ago when you came to uh, speak to us, and I think one of the things that you mentioned at the time was uh, the potential of piloting for uh, with Public Works to be able to use their vehicles, I think, to take all the, uh, the materials that you do collect and, and ship them to wherever uh, they need to go. So I was just wondering if you had any updates on that, or is that all still volunteer-driven in terms of the trucks or the vehicles that you need to do all the work? So, uh, yes, yeah, so the model has changed a bit. We've changed um, how we do the harvests to really localize them. Now that we have so many volunteers in all the city wards uh, and trees to harvest in all city wards and demand in all city wards from local businesses and food banks and community food programs, it's more of a matter of just walking or biking um, 50 to 100 pounds of food uh, to the, lo the food bank and then another 50 or 40 pounds to a processor um, and all of that ends, adds up to about you know 34,000 pounds of food that we've been sh harvesting and sharing over the past few years. So there's no need for those those trucks. Where the trucks would come in is all of the organic waste, and that was uh, a big thing because uh, there a lot of when we get there we can't pick apples off the ground because dogs may urinate. There's health concerns. We have to adhere to OMAFRA's best practices for safe handling of food and. And, and harvesting, right? It's an agricultural practice, right? So the Ontario Minister of Agriculture and Rural Affairs. And so to comply with all of that, um, we're taking all the wind fill, we're putting them in compost bags. So every time we harvest maybe 100 pounds of apples, there's, f if we don't get there early enough, there's 50, 60, 70 pounds of apples on the ground that we have to rake up and put in compost bags and then they take it out to Orga World. Um, so yeah, so that's just roadside composting things and so we're leveraging that now uh, to get more organics into to Orga World, yeah. So you're doing that just on your own with the volunteers that you have mm -hmm. in their vehicles? Yeah, and, and, and we just ask the homeowner if we can leave the bag of compost at the end of their driveway or if they can put it out on, on and, and they do that, so 
And you mentioned uh, in your presentation as well the uh, collaboration with our forestry staff. Can you talk a bit more about what exactly uh, their involvement is in, in the work that you do at this point? Hmm. Yeah, we love them. Um, they're planting thousands upon thousands of, of trees and, and, and more biodiversity. The biodiversity means that some years we don't get a lot of apples, but we might get ton a lot, like little tons of black walnuts. Um, and so that diversity is very important. Uh, they're, they've brought us on as a stakeholder to the Urban Forest Management Plan, and, and they've been listing um, uh, phase two of the Urban Forest Management Plan. Um, in five years from now, they're looking at evaluating what to do with wood waste and food waste from those trees and, and building those structures. Um, what they're doing early on, which I mentioned, was is the marketing campaign to market and, uh, and promote it. Um, but the promotion, what that's going to do is, is just raise the demand, right? It's going to raise the amount of trees homeowners are registering on our website. It's going to raise the amount of volunteers that are registering.
Lambert, and I'm a board member of the Ottawa Festival Network. I am also 